So my topic is uh, making good decisions in the uh, presence of uncertainty. And just uh, by way of background, I'm uh, an agricultural economist uh, here at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, but you know, for the last 20, 25 years, I've involved been involved with some national groups on decision making. Uh, in particular, Decision Analysis Society and the Society for Decision Professionals, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, high-powered people there in terms of uh, going around and, and consulting with Fortune 500 companies on how to make good decisions and so on. And when I tell them I, I work in the area of agriculture, they largely shake their head because of this presence of uncertainty that, that we deal with in agriculture that's such a big deal. Um, so I've been uh, doing this for a while, spend quite a bit of time uh, working with it and uh, find that challenge to be pretty exciting and, and happy to share with you a few thoughts here today to kind of set up the other the other two speakers. And uh, first thing I'd, I'd say that is if you're going to make good decisions in general, you need to have a good decision making process. And uh, this graphic that you see here is the process that I've been teaching for the last five, six years. In, um, in my advanced farm management class here at the university and then also out in my extension circles when I'm working with producers. Um, it's obviously not something that we can get through in a few minutes, so I'll just highlight the, the key points uh, that I work with uh, on this that are relevant to today. And in particular, uh, you want your decision-making process to adhere to what I call the five key principles of a good risk management culture. Um, and the first of those is, is the ability to actually anticipate decisions. And that might seem like, oh, yeah, I'd really like to be able to do that. But if you think about how people typically make decisions, it starts with the uh, recognition that they have a couple of things to choose from. So they typically start in the middle of this graph where they have a couple of alternatives already generated or presented in front of them. And they uh, usually dive right down into the assessment phase of actually evaluating those alternatives and deciding which one to pick. Uh, and matter of fact, when I first was working with decision analysis, that's that's where I was. That's what I I did uh, continually. Um, but anyway, over the years, I've discovered that that's not necessarily the best way to consistently make good decisions and, and definitely not the best way to make them in the presence of uncertainty. Uh, so when I teach decision making in this process, I probably spend 80 to 90 percent of my time up here in this blue box. And one of the key pieces of that blue box is the very first point there, and that is, is understanding the objectives you're trying to achieve by making the decision. And uh, and that's the, the driving factor that helps build that ability to anticipate decisions, because that really equips you with the skills to recognize uh, opportunities to achieve objectives, and also uh, um, allows you to recognize or better recognize those uh, situations or those uh, uh, potential uh, risks that could come into play and uh, negative things that could come into play that can prevent you from reaching your objectives. So that ability to anticipate decisions is largely driven by understanding what it is that you want to accomplish and also uh, on the flip side of that, understanding things that you don't want to have happen. Um, so that's the first piece and uh, I think that's a critically important piece to understand as you uh, work your way through this process of managing risk on your operation. The second one is to have adequate resources and the capacity to respond to changing conditions. Um, if, uh, if you don't have the capacity to respond, obviously that can be super frustrating. And recognizing that up front uh, is an important factor in building that capacity. So the internal context uh, in the blue box that you see there, uh, that's all about recognizing what it is that you have to work with, um, what your current situation is. And, uh, and your ability to actually move forward in a positive way. The third one is this free flow of information into and throughout the organization. And that's these uh, arrows that you see on either side of this graphic. And though it looks busy, I know, uh, but it's meant to be that because if the information isn't flowing into and out of that decision-making process at any point that it's appropriate to do so, uh, you're not gonna be making good choices. So the right-hand pillar of this is uh, this communication and con consult consultation piece. Uh, communication would be within your operation. Uh, consultation would be, you know, the expertise from outside your operation that's, that's providing information to you. Uh, obviously, you want to be, uh, you know, all ears listening and asking the right questions, but then it's also important that that information flow throughout the organization in a very timely manner so that the people who need it uh, get it. Um, and so you don't want somebody uh, recognizing a potential bad situation on your operation and not telling others about it. Uh, same token, one of the best uh, pieces of advice I've heard from a uh, 
leader of a very large company was uh, they have a mistake board, basically, is what it amounts to. So they built a culture where people are not afraid to point out their mistakes on the premise that it prevents somebody else from making the same mistake. Um, so that's a key piece of building a good risk management culture that people know things that do work or don't work and people recognize things that might be an issue and let others know about them so they can be addressed. And then the fourth point is this willingness to learn and adapt. And that's the left hand pillar, the review, measure and revise. Of course, that information flowing is only good if you actually use it. Um, so and part of that is being willing to go back and, and update uh, perhaps some information that you're working with or dig a little deeper to find out a little bit more uh, details there or get a little more accurate or whatever. And then uh, one of the things I can tell you working with students on decision making that they really struggle with is updating their objectives. They, they largely view that as a one and done thing, and it's almost never that. Uh, research has shown that people are only about um, able to identify about half of the things they're trying to accomplish in any decision making setting. Um, so as you realize something else that's important to you as you try to make that choice, it's important to go back and update your objectives. And the reason is because then you, you can continually um, have that in, um, information available to drive future decisions and recognize future decision opportunities. And then the last uh, key principle here is this risk management is embedded in all decision making processes. And that sounds uh, lofty and great. Um, but quite often it's not done. And again, back when I first started working with decision analysis, um, risk was largely part of this assessment phase down here. Usually at the very tail end, you've uh, narrowed it down to a choice, one or two choices, usually just one uh, that you've decided to make. And you're going to do some uh, risk, what you call risk analysis, which is really just uh, you know some sensitivity analysis to kind of see how robust that choice is under different uh, risk scenarios. Um, but it's done after the fact, and that's generally not the best way to manage risk um, for what I alluded to before, and that is, is that you want to know how certain you are about this information and possible changes to that information up here when you're establishing the context in which you're making the decision, and then most importantly, when you're generating uh, potential alternatives to actually uh, uh, choose from and, uh, and, and enact in the future. So, um, so I think this is important stuff to have as a background anytime you're thinking about risk in your operation or anytime you're thinking about actually making decisions in an operation. When it comes to managing risk, there's uh, four primary ways or uh, strategies that might be employed uh, to manage risk. Item one and item four are pretty trivial. Um, item one says avoid it. That's when the risks are just too high and it's something you don't want to do. You just don't engage in the, that activity or that enterprise or those markets or whatever, whatever the situation may be. You just avoid the risk because it's just too much for your particular operation. Uh, item four is that you accept it. And a lot of people, when I give risk management talks, say, well, what do you mean accept it? And it's like, well, sometimes the choices or the alternatives that you might um, employ to actually address the risks are just too expensive, or maybe they're not all that effective. Uh, but you do want to still carry forward with that activity, and you're willing to accept the risk that goes with it. So there's certainly uh, uh, times where it's very appropriate for you to accept risk and just move forward. You recognize it. It's there, and you're willing to go forward anyway. Um, predominantly, though, what I work with producers on are items two and three, and it's just an understanding of whether you're uh, adopting a strategy to transfer risk outside the business. And that's generally done in agriculture through either insurance or contracting. Contracting primarily would be uh, marketing contracts, although it doesn't have to be that, but uh, contract usually transfers over some risk to another party um, and, and provides you some certainty in terms of what's going to actually happen. Insurance, we're used to the idea of paying a premium up front to mitigate a particular risk. And what I'll present here as I wrap up is just to some examples where I think in livestock production in particular, that's become a more accepted uh, part of doing business. Um, but a lot of people are really good at controlling risk within their operation where they take control of it themselves. And when they say control, you're either controlling probability that things will happen or the impact if they do. Um, and keep in mind that I haven't really uh, necessarily labeled these as good or bad. So you can think of it as a probability of something good happen and the positive impacts of it too. Although generally when we're talking about managing risk, people are most worried about the downside of it. 
Um, but it is important to understand that there's very few, few tools or few uh, single actions you can take that actually address both of these. So it's important to think about which one you're actually addressing and maybe another tool that you can employ to address the other side of that equation. So um, controlling the impact, if you just think about things like weather in particular and ag, um, you know, you can't really do much to control the weather. So the probability of that is largely out of your hands. Um, and producers usually focus on controlling the impact of that weather. So drought, for example, right? You have increased feed resources on hand or you don't stop quite as heavily uh, in case there is a drought or you have flexibility on, on um, different feed resources you can tap into or different places you can take your cattle. Um, if you're if you're a cattle operation, and then diversification, just not putting all your eggs in one basket. So you, so you have multiple feed resources or multiple livestock uh, enterprises on your operation. So so one bad year and one enterprise doesn't sink the ship. Um, so a lot of different things that there that people do fairly naturally in ag operations as far as controlling impact and having extra stuff or or extra options available if something comes up. Uh, the probability is sometimes something that people don't think about too much. You'll have some great examples with some of the speakers today on that, um, but maintaining equipment, you know, that, that certainly is going to control the probability of that equipment breaking down at an inopportune time. Um, you know, that'd be opposed to, say, having extra equipment on hand, which would be increased reserves. So you're not necessarily maintaining it any extra uh, in great shape or something, but if it does break down, you have another one to tap into. Those are two different things to think about in terms of managing uh, equipment and the usability of that equipment. Um, I talk a lot with folks about the importance of the human resource side of it and controlling the probability that you actually lose a key employee is something to to take fairly seriously and um, you know, just treating them nice and having not just paying them well, but actually just treating them nice as part of the family and, and giving them some time off on weekends and so on. All of those are things that you can do to control the probability. So I think this is a, just a good summary of things that you can do and think about when it comes to managing risk in any any ag operation. So I thought what I'd do is just close with a couple of uh, examples here on uh, where I think uh, insurance in particular has become a lot more prevalent in the producers I work with. And in full disclosure, most of the producers I work with are cattle producers, cow-calf type of type of producers, a little bit on the feeding side, but mainly cow-calf. Um, and then and then as farming, um, you know, mixes in with that. But uh, but uh, in terms of what uh, I see out there, the, it's important for to understand that a lot of the insurance that we see today from the risk management agency is is fairly new uh, in the big picture. All of this has come about in the last 20 years or so. Um, so it's taken a while to capture in in terms of just being a part of part of business. But we do a lot of education on livestock risk protection insurance and rainfall insurance. And I'll show you some of those changes in the last few years on that. Um, but it's, this has become a lot more like a, a way of doing business for ag producers, so uh, livestock producers in particular. So it's, it's important to understand that. Um, the Farm Service Agency disaster programs, those are more reactive things. The, in other words, the bad event has to happen, disaster declared, and then you go reactively sign up for for things to actually control for the impact of those. Whereas these insurance products are of what we call proactive, and that is, is committing to the protection before the actual event happens, uh, which is why it has to become a part of just your business culture. So just quickly with LRP insurance, if you're not familiar with that, it's a price insurance product tied to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, so for key feeder cattle, which I do a lot of stuff on, it's the feeder cattle index. This is also available for fed cattle. It's also available for swine, but it's a price insurance tool. And in the last few years, it's changed a lot. It's been around since 2003 for cattle, and there's really no change to the subsidy for all of all the 15, 16 years of subsidized at 13%. But over this about two year span here, it became about three times as heavily subsidized. They made a bunch of other changes to make it more accessible to producers. And this is the reaction we've seen from producers. If you focus on this orange line here, since its inception, it's tooled along with about two to 300,000 head insured nationally 
for a lot of years. And then as they started to make these changes, now we're seeing well over 4 million head insured in 2023 with this. This is just the LRP feeder cattle contract. I could show you a very similar graph for L LRP fed cattle and then swine also. It's really taken off tremendously and become just a part of doing business. Um, Another example is that pasture range and forage insurance. This has been around for about 15 years. It's a rainfall index insurance. It's available all over the country. And it's something you have to proactively sign up by December 1 for a calendar year of, of coverage. It's been heavily subsidized since the beginning, but we've had three straight years of drought and we've had a whole bunch of increased use of it. And I would argue it's become a way of doing business for cow-calf producers. This is the, the five-year average from 2018 through 2022 by crop reporting district across the country. And you see some pretty big numbers here, you know, 100 million acres uh, in the mountain zone area and then uh, Northern Plains, 10.7 million and so on. You may be interested to know that in Nebraska alone in 2023, we had 9 million acres insured. This is the five-year average. So if I was to chart this out, the chart would look a lot like that chart on LRP, although not quite as dra dramatic, it, but it's pretty much doubled uh, to two and a half times as many acres insured um, over the last five years, just based off the fact that we've had extremely dry weather out here in the western side of the country. And uh, in the interest in proactively managing for that has gone up tremendously. Um, so those are just two examples where insurance and risk management in a proactive uh fashion has become a lot more uh, part of just a established way of doing business for uh, livestock producers that I've interacted with. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I guess it's a good, not necessarily, I'm not an insurance salesman, but it's good that producers are thinking ahead on insurance or on uh, re managing risk and not just looking uh, reactively to uh, tap into disaster programs after the fact, because there's a lot they can do proactively to manage risk in their operations. Thank you.